Okay, welcome to Eric's Perspective, and uh, we're here with Michael Massenberg. Michael, thank you for coming. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, really looking forward to, uh, to speaking with you. You can let us know uh, a little bit about you and your art and so forth. So starting with the beginning, mm -hmm. can you just uh, let everybody know uh, basically where you were from originally and uh, so forth? We'll take it from there. Okay. Uh, very beginning. Don't remember the beginning. <laughs> but yes, yeah, so when you were in your mother's womb, it was pretty much it was pretty dark. <laughs> but I saw the light. Excellent, excellent. That's the important thing. That's the important thing. So, uh, born in born in San Diego, but raised in L.A. Uh, my I'm only child, my dad was in the Navy, and so uh, I was born in Naval Hospital, so I'm a Navy brat, and uh, moved around up and down the West Coast a little bit for you know for his because of his uh, services and. Then, and went through Long Beach, settled in L.A., and uh, grew up in L.A. most of my life. So that's pretty much California kid. Oh, okay. And uh, both my parents from North Carolina, so it was kind of interesting, the dynamics from having that uh, southern uh, flavor uh, in Cali. So, oh. yeah. so as a child, uh, were you visiting relatives in North Carolina very often? Oh, remember? quite a bit, because at that time there was like, maybe like one or two relatives in L.A. area. And pretty much everybody back east, in, if they were not in North Carolina, they were in New York, New Jersey, uh, D.C. Mm. And so uh, there's a lot of, you know, pretty much most of them are in that part. And so what would happen is that during the summer times, uh, parents would like drive cross country, oh. um, which was a impact on me as a kid seeing us going from California through the whole country and going through to North Carolina. And then also we would go up to also the Jersey and, and uh, New York too. Uh. Uh, and then eventually um, they started sending me by myself by plane. Uh. Uh, can't remember what age, but I was pretty young. Uh -huh. And uh, so I haven't forgiven my parents because when they sent me, they sent me to my grandparents' farms uh, where they raised tobacco. <laughs> so I spent, I spent multiple Listen. summers Working tobacco fields. And I understand that picking <laughs> tobacco is not necessarily a fun thing to be doing. Oh, it's not. It's like, it's one of those things when people talk about, ask me now about like, man, you, Mike, you work so hard. No, that, what I'm doing now is not work. <laughs> working tobacco fields is work. Oh, wow. And, uh, and I understand why my dad joined the Navy. <laughs> <laughs> to get away from the tobacco fields. Oh, yes. <laughs> so you said you went up and down the, the West Coast pretty much, but uh, mm -hmm. where did you guys finally settle uh, when you were a kid? Where would well, you say you, you well, spent we did, the most time? Well, I, th I know we went up to the Bay Area and then went to the uh, state of Washington and then came down to like Long Beach, we were there for like a little bit. In fact, my dad uh, got out of the service when we were in in uh, Long Beach, and it was on, on also in the, where we live in. It was in a, uh, the compounds where they have a lot of the, the service people live. Uh, and then after that, he moved moved to L.A. like over near San Pedro area. Then over, then we moved over to uh, Figueroa near Century, which people we used to call we call it South Central, but now it's called South L.A. <laughs> <laughs> you know how to change the names, oh, right? You know? Right. And so uh, that's what he settled up until the point. Then, uh, then as I got older, moved over to Inglewood. Okay. Moved over to the West Side. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. And so during your childhood, is there anything that kind of stands out as an experience that you think uh, you carried forward and uh, maybe informs your art and so forth? Oh, it's it's real. Yes, it's a lot of things. But I think one thing, because given this time, that period in. Um, we're talking about the uh, now we're talking about the '60s, and then going to the '70s. Um, being too young to really know what was going on in the environment, but I was young enough to see things that were in front of me. One of the things that stuck out in my mind uh, was when the '65 Watts Rebellion. Hmm. Um, we were on the other side of the freeway, so I had no concept or understanding what was going on. But one thing I did see on my front porch was seeing these uh, these Jeeps, you know, and uh, and men with helmets. So I'm thinking about like, like G.I. Joe as a little kid. Uh -huh. I wasn't even thinking about like something bad was going on and very significant was happening in the city. But I remember seeing, you know, trucks and Jeeps parked in the center divider and nearby my elementary school. And so, uh, and I would just sit on the front porch and just watch that. Like I said, again, I'm just a kid, innocent eyes, not knowing what was going on. 
I found out many years later, you know, we that's what it was. And then I'm, my mother, mom said at the time that uh, that was probably the most scariest moment she'd ever been in her life was during that time because they, no one knew what was going to happen because it was it was contained in, in in the area on the other side, but no one knew because something that, that significant hasn't happened like that before in L.A. Wow. So these were soldiers. I mean, they had uh, yeah, weapons. I, I, and... I think they were National Garments, I believe. Yeah. Um, uh, I don't remember seeing that they're. It, it probably might have, they're, I'm sure they had they had guns and stuff. And but again, I'm thinking like, oh man, GI Joes and right. toys and stuff. I'm thinking like that, not knowing. So that was a significant thing. And to a point, like uh, I created a piece many years later called 1965. Was it was in, so I wanted to kind of create stories about my neighborhood, my community, especially that stories outside of that experience, which is well documented in. Uh, in uh, American history, but also want to talk, wanted to also start uh, doing things in regards to, like for instance, the joys of growing up in the area. For instance, um, uh, on Saturday mornings there'd be horses coming down uh, Figueroa because there was a, uh, I'm not sure what what the name of, it, but there was a definitely an area. I think there was some spots in South South Central LA and Compton where. Horses would be coming down the streets, you know, and you like be, as a parade. Or? No, just as like a, you know, like you're going to horseback riding. Oh, you know, I would hear click, 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 click on Saturday mornings as a kid. Wow. Walk outside, you see the, you know, the horses coming down the street. And, was, and who were riding these horses? Oh, it was black folks. Because, but because during that time uh, after '65 Rebellion, there was a white flight. It was pretty. Uh, uh, it became a predominantly black community. After 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 the, the rebellion, and so pretty much as everybody I saw and knew and grew up with was was pretty much uh, African American at that point in time. Wow! But prior to that, there were significant oh, yes. numbers of uh, yes, you know, and even then, as I wasn't really color conscious quite then, but of course that it started to really get an understanding of the world, you know, because especially living there at the time growing up, let's say like you know, like I said my early childhood. Uh, my reality was my my community, my neighborhood. So all I saw was people like me doing different stuff. And then later on in school, we would have like a, a lot of us, uh, my my friends in the neighborhood. We joined the Cub Scouts, and our parents uh, were very involved. So even to this day, there's some of us are still connected with each other. You, you mean know? that you were in the Cub Scouts with? Yeah. Oh, mm-hmm. fantastic. Yeah. So um, so it was really interesting. It was like you know. A simple, you know, community and stuff, but so from the outside, people will be looking at different things. It's like, oh, this happened there, and this happened, and that happened down the street. Like for instance, one of the historical spots, which wasn't really positive, but really historical in regards to landmarking things that happened in the culture, is six blocks down from where we live. There's uh, the area where Sam Cooke was killed. Hmm. Um, it was well documented uh, in regards to his untimely death, but it was actually, you know, within blocks. But I was, again, I was too young to even know what was going on then because as I got older, I was I was a big Sam Cooke fan. And and then f- find out, like, really, like, oh, wow, that's that was down the street, you know. So and I, I became sort of like a little historian, you know, you know, in regards to once I got involved in arts and different things like that. Yeah. So, uh, how did Sam Cook die? If you could tell our oh yes, uh, basically uh, the story is that he was uh, in, a, in in a, I think it was at a club, met a young lady. They went to a hotel, and there was a alleged to be an altercation between the, uh, the two of them. Between two of them, uh, we don't know. It wasn't. I don't know. Remember any information? It was in physical anything as far as altercation, but he came out of the room, uh, I guess, into near the lobby area, and then uh, he was uh, uh, unclosed, and the manager at the building uh, pulled out a gun and shot and killed him. Oh my goodness! Yeah. And there's a lot of conspiracy. There's a lot of conspiracy theories in regards to how and what the details were, and so. Uh, uh, and and the women claim uh, self defense, you know, in regards to who shot him, the, the manager. Oh, uh, so the female companion backed up the manager, uh, basically. Uh, probably. So no one, no one was really charged, you know. Huh. But so it's just a great tragedy because uh, 
because of his story is so significant to to you know music to history to where everything was because he was a he was a very influential and very not only very talented singer but very influential as far as his business moves in regards to uh Owning his a uh, lot of his music and 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 also uh, bringing to the stable like other other musicians and artists. Yeah, he was very popular at the time. Oh yes, that, right? yeah. I mean because after his death, one of the most uh, important songs that came part of the civil rights movement was uh, "A Change Is Going to Come." Yeah, and that was released uh, not too long after he, uh, he he had passed. Right. Yeah. So you know, little things like that, and then uh, and then uh, another little historical tidbit too. Is nearby where the hotel, the hotel is no longer there now, but it was it was there for a long, long time. Mm-hmm. Uh, almost next to it is a market, um, and flash back to 1990, 1992, early 1990s. Um, that's the market where Latasha Harlan was shot by the Korean grocer, hmm. and so me and living in neighbors, that's I was like, oh wow, I'm an artist. Like man, the hotel's here and. The markets there. Not saying they're all related, right. but they're two very important historical things that happen on on the, on that on the block and stuff that involve violence and people yeah. losing yeah. their lives. Yeah. So Latasha was a was a young young lady who was uh, grew up in the neighborhood, and she went into uh, to to the market. Uh, it was it was said that she had picked up an item like a like shoplifting, picking up an item. Yeah, like like a juice or something like that. And then there was like a, a verbal thing, and then as she walked out, the Korean gosher pulled out a gun and shot her and killed her. Um, and there was no evidence of that uh, that the young girl was attacking. She was, you know, and it's, it's on it's on videotape, and that was one of the things along with uh, Rodney King uh, that that was kind of setting the whole mo- moment of of the tension because when the Korean grocer who shot uh, Latasha Harlan was, was was let out and wasn't charged. There was a lot of extreme tension because uh, those things were kind of happening where you know you'll be going to a store and you'll be watched. You know you'll be like you know wouldn't get a service and you'll be treated like you're a criminal and you haven't done anything. Because I had experienced that too in, in a few few of the shops in the neighborhood at that time. Oh. Um, and then. Um, and then also too, so we, we, was, we were waiting on to hear the verdict from Rodney King mm-hmm. situation. And so when the verdict came down, we you you could feel in the air before the verdict. There was like a weird vibe going on. It's, you you felt in the, in the neighborhood, and then once the verdict went down, it just it was over. Yeah. Yeah, so did you witness any acts of uh, vandalism and violence and so forth as a result of that? Or I didn't see any violence, but I did see quite a few vandalism. Uh, at the time, I was working at uh, Aaron Brothers in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. I was one of the uh, managers at, at the store, and I remember uh, working my regular shift, and I would go into the office and, you know, where we have to do our paperwork and stuff. We had a little TV in there, and, uh, and then I... I just happened to walk in there, and, and of course, knowing everybody was waiting to hear the verdict, and then, then I walked in in, in, in my in my office, and, and uh, all of a sudden, uh, they started interviewing. Uh, the verdict had just came down, mm-hmm. and I remember a reporter went up to John Singleton, who you know who, who, oh, we, yeah, who, the, who we just lost last year, right? The director, yeah. uh, and he had did Boys in the Hood, so he was he was he was one of the. Uh, uh, the voices of, sh- of showing the world what LA is like, especially the South Central LA. Yeah. And so, someone, a reporter, went to t- talking to him and try to interview him about his response. And he said, "Like, oh man, this is not good. This is not good." Because we all knew it wasn't good. The ones who live in the neighborhood, because the tension was so thick. Right. But the people who were in uh, in in authority and also in uh, in the higher ups, would it be the mayor and the mayor's office. And of course, the police department you know, at that time was under the Daryl Gates. Uh, and matter of fact, I believe Daryl Gates was like probably at you know was at a some kind of dinner event, and I believe a lot of the some of the, the politicians, including the, the mayor and um, and some of the prominent community leaders, they were I think they were first AME. Mm-hmm. And then when the verdict went down, it's like they were all caught off guard. 
because they weren't connected to it, you know, right. or they were ignoring it. There yeah. was no ignoring the signs, but most likely. And um, so, uh, we would, so we tr- contact like, oh, should, should we close the store down early, something like that, because nothing was happening on where I was at that moment. Uh, and then when uh, we closed it, we closed it down because again, people who are in authority. They don't know how to manage that kind of situation. It's like, oh, no, no need to close up anything. We're, you know, they're in denial. Yeah. But if you've looked, if you're from the neighborhood and the community and stuff, you know, like this is, it's like being being prepared for being, uh, you know, in in an attack in the war, you know, kind of situation. Uh, well, it must have been. Uh, I could just imagine how frustrating. Yeah. Because when you look at the video. I mean, he was clearly subdued, and yet he's getting the crap yeah. beat out of him. Yeah, and it, it was the kind of thing. There was a lot of a lot of us had experience. I even had experience. I didn't have experience of being beat. I didn't have experience of being shot, but I did have multiple experience by having guns pulled on me uh, without any charges against me, where I could have easily lost my life multiple times. Um, police and, pulling yeah. you over, let's yeah. say, and you're and and, and pull, yeah, yeah, pull you over and pull guns and guns in your, I mean, guns in your face, or multiple police officers um, pull out their guns, and so I had to be the calmest person. And if I if I got nervous or I or I, you know, mouthed off or or whatever, then I would have you know I wouldn't be here today. So it was kind of thing. So when that verdict went down so it was a lot of us had different experiences you know some worse and some a little less but but it was we feel like we would been we would be validated like everybody oh you're just making it up oh maybe you're doing something wrong even they said in the, on the video Rodney King must have been doing something before he got beat yeah he had it coming basically as well well like. all those guys with guns and and clubs and he's in, intoxicated he's high well and he's subdued he's subdued all that stuff is like He's not a threat. Yeah. You mean tell me you got to have all those guys beat him to, to, because yeah. whatever he did. Yeah. Um, and apparently when they, you know, during, during the revealing everything, uh, he did not rob anybody, shoot anybody, kill anybody before then. Right. You know. And so, uh, so that was frustrating. And then uh, finally when I left the store, went to, got on the freeway, and that's when I saw some visuals. If I had a cell phone camera back in that day, I would have had some shots as I was going down the uh, the, uh, the Harbor Freeway, coming to, going home. I could see both sides of the freeway. Where I saw little little fires and stuff. Um, it looked like something out of a war zone, you know, like it just it was something unreal. Smoke, you mean? Yeah. And then uh, then I got home and and even the next day uh, you could see stuff because they were looting across the street. Multiple businesses were like burnt down and stuff like that. Well, I was at a friend's house on Olympic mm-hmm. and, and around Fairfax, and then I looked out the window of her apartment, and I could mm-hmm. see. Mm-hmm. Uh, you mentioned earlier about soldiers. I could see the National Guard with helmets and rifles, oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, being uh, trucked to some area. You said war zone. I mean, that's exactly what it resembled. Yeah, sure did. And I, mean, I mean, you got you got armed. Uh, yeah, uh, military personnel. Yeah. Oh yeah, they were they were they were ready Motivate. armed, you know, and which is not surprising because at the time, uh, you know, the military is going to be prepared, but the but the police department at that time were getting uh, top of the line uh, equipment. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, uh, one of the things that was that that was prominent uh, when they had what called a batter ram. You know, that used to like drive up to some people's, people's houses and apartments and kind of just just bull them bulls over over the you know instead of like having a warrant you know and right. and uh and uh and 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 uh have communications with the occupant they could just just go and just bulldoze your front door down wow. you know it's just like it was inhumane it was like you know, they were like they were dealing with us as as like animals and stuff yeah, so it was very horrible. yeah and it's the kind of thing uh if people see see the uh the Straight out of Compton movie. Mm-hmm. There's a scene where that battle ram is being used and how it rams it up. It seemed like a like a fairy tale kind of uh, fantasy type of uh, action drama, but yeah. that stuff was real. So the battle ram itself, if I have this right in my own head, it's, yes. it looks like a tank. But yes, a, it did with a great big uh, yeah. thing coming out instead of a barrel. It's like a yes, like, like a big. I don't know. Yeah, it's like it's it's unreal. projection that just it, it, burst down the door. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. You, you have that right. And then uh, they had 
the, all the top techno technology at that time because they were getting funded because because it was a war on drugs, which was a cold world war on black and brown folks. Yeah. You know? And so, um, you know, it's so yeah. funny because I yeah. know a lot of folks yeah. might think, gee whiz, that's such an exaggeration. But when you're on the receiving end of it, oh, you, you can recognize and you witness it yeah. firsthand and you live it. Yeah. It's a whole nother, yeah. whole nother story. And especially when, when, for me, I'm starting to study history. I wasn't doing, uh, I was always doing art stuff, but I didn't even know about what that meant growing up as a kid. But as I got a little older and I was, I decided I wanted to make it my livelihood. That was the other parts that I was adding on to the social element, you know, because I felt to me it was important for me, for my own therapy, for my own one and sharing uh, life experience, my own one and share the the truths. Uh, um, you know, kind of like since the news wasn't gonna say it. The truth, I said, I want to say the truth because I, I lived it, you know. So what you're saying basically is that um, this kind of thing, wanting to voice your experiences and mm -hmm. share with the world what was going on, but maybe not a lot of people knew about. Yeah, that was partly what motivated you to become an artist. Yeah, it was. It was. Uh, there was some other factors because in the beginning, uh, I'll backtrack a little bit in regards to the childhood. So like in uh, in the earlier kids, it sort of was a lot more simpler time. <laughs> those things happen much, you know, much later in my young, you know, my teenage or young adulthood. But the foundation, I think, with the art thing kind of start to develop is when, because the only child, there's no, obviously no social media, you know. Uh, you had a TV in the home, but it was in the living room. Right. And so me being the only child, I did have my, own, have my room. So if I did my homework, or, you know, I might read a book or something, then it's like, What's there to do? I mean, I had like things to play with, but then I start like drawing t to entertain myself or to do something. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what sparked my imagination. But I did not un know or understand what that was. It was just something I just did. It wasn't from the parents. It wasn't from any of the kids. It wasn't about, I didn't even know about anything about art. I don't remember even going to a, a museum. Really? As a kid, might have if it if I did, it didn't make an impression on me uh, <laughs> on my brain at the time. Yeah, because I have friends that say, "Oh, I went to the museum and changed my life," and I was like, "Man, I I, I don't remember even going <laughs> or oh, going on the trips. I'm sure the school did and the classes did, but I don't remember anything about that." You know, you know, and then so um, uh, as I got a little older and I still was doing drawing and stuff like that, and and uh, I graduated from Washington High School. And I remember my high school teacher said, like, asked me, like, uh, what were my plans uh, when I graduated? I said, I'm not, I'm not sure. He said, whatever you do, don't become an artist. You know, you know, <laughs> you and, know that's a funny thing, because I, I talk to a lot of artists. They say the exact same yeah, thing. Yeah, Even yeah. sometimes for their own parents. Oh, oh yeah. And so one thing about my parents was really, was really interesting. Uh, since I didn't have any concept about being an artist, I never shared it or talked about it and desired that I was going to do. Yeah. And so, but I would say if I mentioned it, they would probably, probably would have supported it. Oh, because, that's great. Because the other things I was always involved in as a kid, uh, I'd say I, I must be a true kid, but it's like when I think about it, is no one would ever predict or really let me be surprised because I was a big hockey fan as, as a young kid. No kidding. I never played hockey. I was just fascinated <laughs> with the game. You right. Know? And so I watched the games. I watched the the L.A. Kings. And, and was that your team? Is you, is you that was my that? team. But there was another team in L.A. Oh. that people may not know unless they were around there in time or a historian. It was the World Hockey Association. And they had the L.A. Sharks that used to play at the sports arena. People were like, what? What is that? And you went to see the games live. Uh, yeah, I went to see the games. I would draw pictures from the program because I would ask. My dad would take me because I, I want to go to the hockey game. And we would go to all the games. So during that time, for those historians, um, when the Kings were playing, it was like Rogi Fashan was the goalie, Butch Goring, you know, was one of the forwards and stuff. So I, I still remember some of the names and stuff. Um, I don't remember anybody on the Sharks, but I remember their uniforms. They had a black uniforms, ah. while the while the Kings had at that time gold. And we know later on, now the Kings had to go a black uniforms too. Oh, okay, you know? and so. Uh, I was, to put it in context, that league folded, but before, when, when it folded, some of those teams went into the National Hockey Association. Oh. The most famous player that was on one of those teams was Wayne Gretzky. 
for the uh, Edmonton team. Okay. And so, of course, he eventually went to the Kings, and you know and, that that changed. And there's a banner that hangs in the Staples Center mm-hmm. with his name on it. So yeah, so he's one of the all time greats. So. So that was that was one of the fun things. And another thing I used to drag my dad to, to take me was to auto racing, stock car racing, uh, Formula One racing, uh, Indy racing, uh, <laughs> drag racing. I, was, I would just, and again, I would like draw pictures and stuff, and and we would go to all these different events. Where to be? There used to be the Ontario Motor Speedway, uh, and we would go to all those things. We would go to. Drag race. I mean, we went to a lot of stuff. So, uh, if 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 I knew or had a concept about art thing, they would have not knowing that the LA was was full with a lot of amazing artists. I had no idea until I was an adult, almost. Wow. You know, and so because um, the only artist that I knew about was Van Gogh and Picasso, and Da Vinci, but they not from the hood. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I had no idea. Like that's there's. As far as timeline and distance, there was no relation, no connections. I still, still didn't get the art thing at that point. So, at what point would you say you did get the? Art thing? Uh, I would say like, so one of the things that happened is that um, I had a college counselor in my high school said, asked me, uh, brought me in, and asked me more plans for college, and I hadn't really fully thought it out thoroughly. I've thought about maybe okay, I'll do like art. But I don't know, really know anybody or know anything about it. I said, well, maybe I might do commercial arts and trade tech or something. Mm-hmm. I said, that was just a thought. I didn't really follow up on it. It was just something like, since people were asking. <laughs> yeah. I would just, I don't know, I guess I was just one of those kids who was just floating along and I didn't, there was no really pressure on me and stuff. So at this point, were you already in college or were you just beginning? So, so what was happening was, I was in I was in high school and she asked me you know, about like applying for college because my grades were were good. Mm-hmm. I said okay, I I think I can apply for college. I, said, I never thought about applying for college. I said I thought college was for, for smart people. You know I didn't think I was because I had friends that were going college prep classes and stuff. They were yeah. preparing. I, I don't know where my head was, but I wasn't preparing for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like floating along, you know. And so I did apply to one school. Uh, which is interesting. I should apply for multiple schools, but I only I settled on one. Was Cal State Long Beach? Cal State Long Beach. Uh, they did have they do uh, they did have a very uh, popular art program, and during that time, so uh, I enrolled. Eventually, I was able to take some classes. I never declared a major, and what was happening with those classes was I was getting a lot of C's. And would these be uh, art classes? It was just... art in, in art classes. Okay. In design and stuff like that. So what was happening was, and I look back now, I did all my assignments, but I didn't do it at a level that was expected from my instructors because my instructors also had were professionals. They had design studios and they were like managers and production head of productions, oh. and they demanded the same thing from the students. I had never had that kind of pressure or experience of. Of, of that, I turned and something. Man, it's like I'm gonna see. I, I did the I did the assignment. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I did the assignment, but it was like it wasn't you know at the level of what they expect from other students, and so it was sort of like either you rise up or you just sink. You know. So did you find that discouraging? Or, or it, was it was it a motivator. Or it, it was discouraging. But there was one one class, one teacher I had, which wasn't in the design field, was a painting class. His name was John DeHarris, and uh, he was teaching painting class. I took his class. And that was the spark because what he did, he pushed me and, uh, and, and also challenged me because one time we had a class assignment. They're supposed to do a, uh, do, uh, uh, a draw, uh, doing nature, landscaping, you know, you know, as far as like, uh, you know, live and stuff like that, go outside and, you know, draw, you know, nature and stuff like that, trees, plants and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So... I was naturally lazy, so, and I, so I had this book, you know, I, I was kind of glancing through it. Just, I was glancing through it at first. I wasn't thinking about using it. I saw this picture of this tree. Oh, man, I love this. So I just, I, I did a little pen and sketch copy from it, you know, because mm-hmm. I just I just loved the way it looked and how it feels. It was pen and ink. So, so when we had our critique, we put everything on the wall, and then everybody said, Oh man, that's man, that's good, man. I was like feeling myself, feeling all good. I'm like, I'm like, okay, all right, thank you, thank you. The yeah. teacher walked by, looking at everybody. He walked by, it, said, "Nice job." Next time, draw from life, and kept on walking. So that was probably <laughs> the piv- that was a pivotal moment of my laziness, uh-huh. you know, being called out. Yeah, 
and then making me accountable. So when he evaluated, he said, like, you had a talent, but you just need to work. And so he worked with me. Uh, I had him for a couple of classes, and I actually got B's out of his class. And so, because uh, I never had anybody push me to be better. Well, and it also sounds like he took an interest, interest oh, yes. in you. Oh, yes, he sure did. He was a good teacher, basically. Yeah, and I saw him some many years later, and he's a practicing artist. He's, you know, he's a retired, and, and he was doing a solo show in Santa Monica, and I was, went by and, and thanked him. In fact, uh, when I saw him, uh, the book that we did at, at your gallery that, that, we, that we created for the, for the show in 08, I had that copy, and I gave it to him as a thank you because I talked about it in our interview yeah. you know, So because it was very significant yeah, but what was re- also what was really interesting well, even though I had the experience in the art department I did not declare an art major well, what was a shift was happening was I decided I got in business with my dad and so we got it, started a DJ business and then eventually um, it, it kind of grew into an imprint sportswear so it became like a full player small business and so I was getting further and further and further away from the art thing. But one of the last things I did take was a, in a black studies department uh, at a teacher named Vanel De Silvers. And he, he had this book called, uh, Af- I think it was called African American Arts, whatever it was. It was written by Samela Lewis. And, and so it was the first time I saw a book of images, comprehensive of all these black artists that I didn't never heard of, didn't know about, it's like I was like blown away. Uh, wow, this is this is amazing. I never seen anything like this. You know, I felt kind of like connected to a lot of things that was in this book. And then another thing happened in that same class. Uh, he he didn't, a teacher mentioned like, oh, I'm going to be teaching a, a painting class at the Watts Towers Art Center. So he invited us to come through from, you know, his students to come through there. So I decided to come through. The other funny part is I live less than 10 minutes from the Watts Towers and never been there before. <laughs> Didn't even know it existed until he mentioned it. Wow. And, and then so when I go to the painting class, my mind was blown seeing all these black people in, in this room painting, listening to jazz, I said, did I die or something? And it was just kind of like, you know, it's like I never, it was like, it just blew my mind, you know? Yeah. I just like, I didn't know it was there. I didn't, and then walked into something like that, which is like, like really overwhelming, but, but overwhelmed with, with joy and excitement. And so that was one of my um, last art experience during that period. So I could, so the next five, seven years, focus on the business and stuff like that. And then, uh, then once we, once the, we closed that chapter, and that was a great chapter. It, it taught me a lot about entrepreneurship when that word wasn't popular. Mm-hmm. Um, so I learned how to, you know, you know, manage the staff, uh, and then also everything was like on, on my own because there wasn't any college courses at that time on entrepreneurship. In fact, I became a business major uh, with emphasis in marketing at Long Beach, and um, and so I would had run my business during the day and go to school at night up to the point I just like, I, I just, I need a break. So I took a break. I took a leave of absence, <laughs> believe it or not, as a senior. Because at that point, I was just like just tired. Kind of burnt out. Uh, burnt out because none, nothing in, in my college courses was related to the real world for me, you know. And so, uh, but the real world was gave me a lot of stuff that I can, that, that was be a service to me in the future. And so went ahead and uh, uh, focused on, you know, uh, the business, uh, wasn't doing art, um, and became, like I said, uh, a full-time entrepreneur. And then we did that for a number of years, and then eventually we, we closed that char- chapter down. And then the next thing was to find out what I want to do next. And then um, and one of the things happened when... Um, I was took a job driving super shuttle vans at the LAX, and I would do that for like a year. And I decided, like you know, one day um, we were all in the uh, in the holding area before we went into the airport to pick up uh, uh, people from from their flights and stuff. And so you know, people had newspapers and books and drinking their coffee and smoking a cigarette and stuff like that. And so I was bored, so I started 
for some reason I had like a little book, encyclopedia. Someone must have told me to bring it, and I had a piece of paper. And pencil. Probably I was going to do something just, just to entertain myself. So I started drawing something, mm-hmm. and actually it was a picture. And I remember the picture. It was a, it was an encyclopedia. It was a picture of Nani, Nani Komenichi, who was a, a gymnast, a, a gold, gold medal winner. And I drew the picture, and I finished it. And I was like, oh my god, this is like. This is kind of cool. It's like, it looks pretty good. I haven't I haven't drawn a didn't did any kind of art thing for like eight years at that point because of wow. my my thing working in the business uh, aspect. Uh-huh. And I got excited. Oh man, this is, I think I want to do this because at this time I went through different life experiences: being broke, filed bankruptcy, uh, have bought a uh, first house property in San Bernardino, you know, and I was just like, you know. And then it was personal stuff going on. That was like breakup of relationships and stuff. And, you know, just like a whole bunch of things was going on. So I said, you know, I think I want to do art. I didn't know anybody, didn't know where to go. So, but I decided I'm just going to start. And so uh, so once I uh, decided to go that route, I started like doing research and figuring out what I want to do, the next step. So I said, okay, let me address college. So I said, okay, I can go back to Long Beach, uh, finish up my degree, uh, for for uh, for business, that was one one plan, and then go from there and start building from the art after, after that. Mm-hmm. And then the next thing was like, if I'm able to get a scholarship or a grant or financial support uh, to go to an art school, the, the downside to start from ground zero, uh, that was plan B. Guess what plan I went to with plan B? Plan B. <laughs> because it was like, if, even though I, if I started from, from the ground zero, it was something I wanted to do. If I went to try to finish my degree for business, it would have been hell for me because I just, I already, reason why I, I, I stopped because it was just, it was just, uh, it didn't make any sense. Right. You know? And so, uh, so, I, so, I, so I applied to Otis at that time was uh, Otis Art Institute at the time. Now it was Otis Art and Design. And uh, they were downtown MacArthur Park. So I applied and, and uh, got a grant from the state and got accepted. And so I started that journey in there. And I did that for like about a year. And, uh, and I had to leave uh, at some point because I had issues with the uh, financial, head of the financial department, which... Uh, and I'm glad I left because it would have been really bad. It was some other things that was going on that was really. You mean financially related? Uh, yeah. No, it was. It was. It, I won't say financial. It was more about like. Uh, I don't know if it was discrimination or oh. incompetence, but basically, what well, I was told from this particular person said, like, who was the head of the department for for the financial aid, he said that the school do not accept this particular grant. I had all the paperwork from the state. Everything was just active. Oh. And the thing about it, I was getting upset because like, now I'm a young adult. Yeah. I had life experience, ran a business, uh, did a lot of customers. I mean, I'm not no 17 year old, 18 year old kid. Right. It's like, you got to tell me, well, what do you mean? Like, what, is, what do you mean? I got paperwork that says that it does. That's how I ended up getting the grant. It's listed as one of the eligible schools to be uh, to accept this. That is such a bizarre situation where it was, the school it, re- it, rejects money it, yeah. from the state of California. It pretty much. It doesn't really mean. Yeah. So uh, it felt like it was coming from this individual who's supposed to be, you know, the head guy for that department. So during the first year, that conversation started then. But I wanted to go to school so bad, so I ended up like uh, – talking to a few administrators who kind of calmed me down and I decided to take out a student loan just so I could get the first year in. And by the way, did you have a good experience with the art instructors themselves? Well, it was interesting. Uh, I, I, I did okay in multiple classes. This is where I realized what type of art, art artist I wanted to be without even knowing. I took, uh, I took you know, design classes because it was actually for a, a special program they had. It was geared toward... Uh, uh, graphic design professionals and stuff who wanted to go in that field. Mm-hmm. So I took some of those classes. I did okay. But the classes I got the most enjoyment was when I took an oil painting class. Mm-hmm. You know, I really got into those and stuff. And I, I liked the other classes, but it was the, uh, the, the, 
the fine art classes was the one I really was gravitating toward. And then did that experience carry over in the future? I mean, yeah, looking it, back on it? Yeah, it, it, it definitely uh, created a spark. And then, um, and then I, I wanted to enroll for the second year, and I ran into the same situation with him. It got to a point where I had to walk out and leave after I was talking to him. Because so, I, I, I was so angry that if I stayed, I would have I lost it. Do you think that it was racially motivated? It could have been. Um, it was one of those things, especially one thing about being in California, there can be racially motivated and it won't be obvious. Mm -hmm. It could be through policy. It could be through, you know, le legalities. It, oh, we're so sorry. Like, you know, like we, we, we just filled that position up. That was stuff I was hearing when I was trying to get jobs in, when I was in San Bernardino. Mm -hmm. I was always missing jobs, like and I never just, had I just, never had problems getting jobs before. You know? Just in the nick of time, they they filled it, and you, yes, you, you all yeah. of a sudden were left. Yeah, so <laughs> so one of the things he said, like, well, uh, maybe you should reapply again. That was what he told me during the second year. Really, and I had to leave because if I stayed, I would have I would have held. I would have lost it. It would have been ugly. It would have been ugly. And I, I, I thought, I think about those moments, especially um, when I talk to young people in regards to choices and how we manage ourselves. I say, like, no matter who you are, we're going to have these moments where you have to walk away, you know. And uh, and and it's like like a voice that told me like, leave. Right. Because if I didn't leave, because I was planning to. Because you would have been on the bad end of that situation. Probably. Yeah, I mean, I was I was already planning out what I was going to do to him. Right. I mean, it was, if, uh -oh. it, which is bad. I'm too scared to ask. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and the thing about it is, I'm such a mild mannered, you know, happy go lucky person. People that know me, but also I think because growing up as an African American in this country, there's layers and layers of stuff that we don't realize what we have until we get tested yeah. and be pushed. Um, and so it was one of those things where um, it's it's hard to prove when you have evidence, yeah. and it's hard to prove when you don't have evidence and stuff. You know, well, it's impossible. It's impossible. Yeah. Even, and even though um, um, we saw situations where there's no evidence and people were getting the support, yeah. you know. And so, um, so I left there, and I one of the, the first thing I did was well, since I'm no longer in school, I said, let me go to the Watts Towers Art Center. So I start going up there. Look at the bulletin board, seen exhibits. I was very quiet and shy. Not like now. I'm talkative. I can talk for hours about art. I didn't talk to no one, you know. And so I walked in, and then I uh, then I went to the, saw this guy at the front office. And we started talking, and he was saying like uh, we had a short conversation the first time, and he said uh, so. I told him what I was and stuff like what I was doing. What I was interested. He said, yeah, I remember you. My friend was like you remember me. From, oh, from, from the earlier time when from you that, were there one, that one time I was in that class yeah. with all these other people I don't remember who this guy is uh. I don't remember nothing I didn't. I just remember faces Yeah, but I don't remember any individuals mm -hmm. so he said like he remember me I said man this guy this guy can remember me from eight years ago you know and it was John Otterbridge John Otterbridge the, the, the art legend of Los Angeles yeah you know? absolutely so I ran to him and we became like uh, very good friends and stuff, and and we would have a lot of multiple conversations, and he would introduce or or, or give me inf contact information to like people like Cecil Ferguson and a few others and stuff. And Cecil Ferguson, who just yeah. not too long ago passed yes. away, and yes, yep. yeah. So so that became my university. So I would like go hang around. I would go to every art show. I would go to events. I would. Volunteer to help, you know, uh, different did, things. Did they the still scene. offer art instruction there at that time? Yes, it's, yes, yeah. yep. And even down, even today, well, now we have still going strong in the tradition to under the guidance of uh, Rosalie Hooks. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but yeah, it's just one of those things where uh, it kind of grew and grew, and then uh, and then I did start had to. Uh, I took a job. Aaron Brothers, we talked about before. Yes. So I started taking a job from there. And then the other things started happening with the, was happening, going back to our point, talking about the city at the time in 1992. The other thing that was significant was my, was my mother, who became uh, ill. You know, uh, She had a series of issues that she found out later in her, in her life that she had lupus and there were some other complications, different things. And so she was in the hospital during time of um, 
she was uh, during the time of the uprising. Mm-hmm. And so I would go visit her and stuff, I mean, my dad and stuff. And then, uh, and then one day I decided to, uh, you know, it was nothing was really out of the ordinary. So we went, went there and started talking to her, but I talked to her a little differently this time. You know, I was one of those kept, kept my feelings to myself kid, you know, like a lot of us, a number of us and stuff. And I just started talking about, you know, at that time she couldn't, she couldn't really speak. Uh, she had stopped talking, but she was still present and stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, but, you know, but her eyes are closed, but, you know, she wasn't speaking. So, um, so I just started telling her, you know, how much I really loved her and appreciated and stuff like this. All I just kind of just pour out all my emotions and stuff that I wanted to say that I never said before, mm-hmm. you know, and that was it. You know, then I go back home. Some hours later, we get a call from the hospital, said she passed. And I, all I can just sit there is like, because she listened to, she heard everything I said, you know. And, but it wasn't, but I wasn't thinking about it. it was a fail world. It was just something I wanted to say at that moment because I think I needed to say because I never said it before. You know, what a uh, fortuitous thing, though. I mean, you were able to speak yeah. to her in that manner if I, if just I never before s- she passed away. Yeah, because. One day later, you would have missed the opportunity. Yes, if I never expressed that, um, that would have been a great, man, I never tell my mother I loved her. Yeah. Even though she know I did, I, right. you know, very affectionate, but I never said those words yeah. on a regular, you know. Yeah. And so, um, so she passed on, and then we start, you know, me, me and my auntie had uh, put together arrangements for here and also in North Carolina, and so it was a beautiful service. Um, but the other significant thing happened was when they were uh, reading her eulogy. In part of the eulogy, uh, there was a part talking about me doing art, how she was so proud. At that time, I'd done like three or four art shows, um, you know, in group shows. I mean, having, I was just at the very, very beginning. She'd been to a few shows and stuff. Uh, and I think she was, she saw more in me and knowing that thing before I did. And so it was a kind thing that, wait, I'm here celebrating my mother's life, but I'm hearing about how she was proud of me doing art. Wow, that's very touching. I mean, that's it was so like, I'm just like, and then after, after the service was over, then a uh, number of people from her job said, oh, yeah, she talked. I, I got more conversations from people just like, oh, yeah, she talked about you doing art all the time, this and that. Can, can you draw for me? Can you draw my dog? So, you know, so I was like, <laughs> I'm like in a, in a, in, in a, in an unusual space, you know, not, not only losing losing your, your 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 parent, but also this whole notion that all these people knew about my me doing art, and I'm just not getting started. Yeah, you didn't you didn't know all this before. I mean, she's, I mean, I I knew she was supportive, but I didn't know she was you know talking bra- bragging about, about me. Yeah, talking about <laughs> you like that. Yeah, right. That's beautiful. So it was it was a beautiful thing. So like it. it it, what it did, because a lot of as as a child, you always want the support and approval of your parents, and, and I did definitely have that. That was no doubt about that. Uh, uh, I think they just wanted to make sure that I was safe, that I was able to do something that that was that was uh, kind of really uh, find who I am, mm-hmm. because they were both active in the community. My, uh, my mom was like. Uh, PTA uh, president of my of my elementary school. Uh, my dad was a was a salesman, and he was one of the top ones in uh, in, in his company. And, uh, and what was he selling, by the way? Uh, he was selling he was selling paint for Dutch Boy Paints, and he also worked at Sears uh, for a number of years. And uh, and so uh, and my my mom was always in leadership stuff, and my dad was always involved in a lot of things. So they they raised a lot of money and stuff like that for the Y. For their, one of their new facilities, so it was a lot of different things they were doing. So it kind of, I was able to uh, have some of those things impacting me too. So, so Michael, uh, where are you now when it comes to your art? Well, basically, uh, full circle. Now, what's happening now? Um, because of those life experiences, I kind of like molded into several different aspects. One is an art education, where. Uh, I teach classes and also do projects working with with, uh, with primary to, uh, youth, and uh, especially I did a lot working in uh, juvenile facilities, and those were kind of things that kind of sprung from after the ninety two uh, aftermath that I wanted to do something that was connected. So that's part of it. So you're teaching actual 
art mm -hmm. itself, out of how to do it. Yes, so how to do it. And so too, it was great. I get a chance to have these one-on-one -on -one or group conversations with students about their life and uh, things about future. Mm. The other aspects is uh, doing public art, creating art in communities that may not go to uh, museums or may see they may see art, but they may not see and see themselves. Mm -hmm. So I was fortunate enough to do projects at the Fabulous Forum in Inglewood, uh, Metro uh, Line in uh, Farmdale Station, and uh, American Jazz Museum in Kansas City. Um, I, I did a first mural I'd done in uh, uh, in uh, Bogota, Colombia, a couple of years ago, and doing multiple things and stuff in that realm. Wow, excellent. Yeah. So of all those various areas, is there one? Oh, yeah, there's another area. There's another area where I was able to really get my personal statement on is in, in the contemporary art scene, which I was working with, you know, with, with your gallery, which helped propel it and put it in its, in its context because I was able to create these visions that was unedited, that was purely from my heart and soul, that what I want to say and do, working in different means from, from drawing, painting, collaging, assemblage, and be able to sit, tell these stories and these experiences. And that's the thing I recall from that show that you mentioned about in 2008, and mm -hmm. uh, we got the catalog uh, mm -hmm. went along with it. Um, uh, a lot of that work was informed by your roots in North Carolina, for example. For sure. And family, and mm -hmm. what you were talking about earlier, the mm -hmm. civil rights era, uh, mm -hmm. 65, and so forth. Yes. So yes. Uh, are you still in following those themes today? Uh, yeah, it's, it still have those themes, but it's it awesome. Any, anything new? Anything other uh, themes you're exploring now? The, the other theme, because uh, I've been doing a lot of traveling in the past few years, uh, where I was going you know, to spend time in Cuba, Haiti, Colombia, and then got a chance to uh, recently go to Barcelona, um, into into uh, uh, Paris, and a few other spots. It's a lot of, and so what's happening is I'm looking at. I always been about community, still am about community, but also it has a global perspective now too. Mm -hmm. So what's happening? I'm also adding a layer of the African diaspora, meaning blacks who are in different regions, whether it be in the islands, yes, uh, whether it be in uh, Mexico. Central and South America uh -huh. about the Middle Passage. So I'm also doing a layer of that. Oh, so that's okay. been in addition to uh, still doing community, yeah, yeah, local and also global too. And seeing the connection relationship through uh, through historical, cultural, and also spiritual practices. Oh, very cool. Yeah. And how do you see your art going forward? I mean, in terms of the future, have you had, have you thought about that? Uh, yeah, it's it's. I think it's for me. It's always been organic, uh, ever growing. Because uh, my whole thing has been about like art that uh, that empowers uh, communities uh, locally and globally. So if it's fulfilled in that, so that means I'm there's still a lot more to do with that because that's still in the beginning stages. Yeah. Uh, the latter part just shared, and uh, who knows, I might end up going to outer space with it. <laughs> <laughs> Got to hook up with uh, Elon Musk and uh, exactly. Yes, <laughs> get on the SpaceX era exactly. situation. I'm, I'm open to it. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's it's really amazing to hear how close they are to getting all that stuff. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, in play. Maybe. Yeah, because I'm also I'm always fascinated when I look at would it be nature, uh, landscapes, uh, aerial views of the, of the of the of the planets and stuff. Yeah. They kind of informed and kind of like a sense of place, yeah, you know, and also a sense of self at times. And then I'll add these personal elements. I find like letters, postcards, photographs. It's been fun. It's like unlimited. You know, it's like well, that's the other thing when you think about mm -hmm. how small our you know galaxy is in relation to the universe. oh yes. Yes. It's just mind blowing to it is. think about yes. you know, the possibilities and all that. It puts in perspective like we're all just a little little bit speck in this whole big thing, but we all can make a difference in, in some way or form, whether it be one person or a lot of people. Uh, so I think it's I feel fortunate I'll be able to have a vehicle that I can express myself in a way where a lot of people may not feel like they have a way to express themselves. Yeah. So I've been f fortunate and blessed because it's easy for me to go a different direction and not be doing this. Yeah. I know I would have been. Well, you were tempted and you yeah. did go in a different direction. Yeah. Your, yeah. Your so, development as a, And so it, as a it, all those life experiences has, has really helped me uh, to where I'm at today. So, Well, and you know, the complicating thing is that you got to survive the whole time. So, yes. You know, yes. That, that could obviously. 
Yes, I I, it's I, ugly head. It's kind of a a challenge. I know I've spoken with some artists, for example. Oh who, yeah, who would say, you know, they might be tempted to create work that they realize would sell, mm -hmm. but the <laughs> price they pay for that is they get locked into that and maybe yes. lose touch with their soul, so to speak. That's true. It's it's, it's very. It's, I understand those things. That's why I'm so glad I had the uh, entrepreneurial experience ahead of time because I was able to still have integrity in the things that I want to do. So I'm very particular, like for public art projects that I, w I, w I would want to apply for or take on. Yeah, uh, I don't just I don't take it on for the money, and not to saying that the money is not valued, but it is valued because, uh, but also it's not defined by like just because it's a million dollar project. That don't mean I want I, I need a. I, I need to jump into it, yeah. but it's to be something that speaks to my soul and, and my spirit about and, and my goals and my direction. I'm more inclined to do those, you know, and then uh, that's really what the legacy is about because people can feel that. Oh, know? absolutely! Yeah. I had one young artist I never will forget. Uh, mm -hmm. I used to do, as you might recall, in the gallery, uh, artist-led art tours, and yes. if it was a group show, I'd invite various artists who were in the show. Mm -hmm. If it was a solo exhibit, that artist, if they felt comfortable doing it. Yes. And I remember, I forget, there was this one young, one young artist who said, when he was asked by one of the people in the tour, mm -hmm. uh, why, do you, why, do you, uh, why do you do your art? Mm. And his response was, because I have to. Yes, and, and I can like, relate to that. I, I was going to ask you if you can relate to that. It's oh, like an impulse much. you have to respond yeah. to because yeah. it's something inside of you. Yeah. Yeah, because I, I, I think that as human beings, we all want to express ourselves. We express in different ways. And because when we express it artistically, is all there's a lot of misunderstood or minimized in our culture here in the United States. When I travel to other countries, I really don't know the power of art and culture because uh, it's embraced. It's, it's kind of like everyday life. But here, um, it's one of those things where uh, it's so important to kind of like you know really use those things to kind of like you know be a be a benefit, and so I'm glad to be able to be able to do that. You know? yeah. yeah, and I recall uh, reading about Charles White, for example, who oh, taught at Otis yes. before you were there, obviously, yes. because he passed on in 1979. But yes, obviously, a very well respected artist, one of my heroes. And yeah, and one of the things that was notable about him, as as the historians have recorded, is mm -hmm. he did a style of art that really wasn't that popular. At exactly. The time. Exactly. I mean, he's more figurative. He's more realistic. He's more social realistic, and abstraction was the key. And that that's was, true. That was the key to commercial success. Yeah. And yeah. He resisted the temptation to go that route and stay true to his own voice. I'm so so glad he did because um, he he influenced so many artists who were you know whether it be James Karen Marshall, David Hammonds. I mean, it's like it's like a who's who of contemporary art. And also, we just had a major exhibition of Charles's work at LACMA, and that, uh, that traveled. By the way, it traveled. It was in, Chicago, it was in New York. Yes, coming here in LA. Yes, yeah. because uh, during the time when you, you talked about uh, Charles, he was more popular in Europe than he was in the United States, yeah. as far as being acceptance. Yeah, you know, so being integrity with your work is think is, and so is so important. So that's what. So when I decided to do the entrepreneur thing early years, I was able to make sure that I can do things that's not going to alter what I want to create. Yeah. yeah. And so for any of those young artists who might be listening, mm -hmm. uh, do you have any uh, any advice you can share with them? I, I would say uh, if you you got to be passionate about it, and then if, once, once you have that, uh, kind of have a you know, dream about what, what the possibilities are and put a circle of people around you that support you. And don't listen to the haters. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably really key. Yeah, know, yeah, it's like that can be discouraging. Can, I right? mean, there's there's other parts, but those those are the main pieces. Without those main pieces, of, uh, uh, a circle of support system is extremely important. You can't go on this alone. Yeah, you, it don't matter no matter how talented you are, but that support system, whether it be family, whether it be a team of people you grew up with, but to have a shared vision that will support you unconditionally. Yeah, and tell you the truth. Yeah, yeah. Not no yes people. I'm talking about people that will tell you the truth. Would be, and um, and then everybody benefits. The world benefits. Well, you know, that was one of the things I remember hearing uh, William Pajot, obviously, Ooh. who you cite as, a, as an Ooh, influence. Man. I remember him saying yes. one of the things that he benefited from and also he tried to share with younger artists was yep. that sort of honest feedback. Mm-hmm. 
and they would gather sometimes at the Brockman Gallery, oh, man. which was more than a gallery. It was a place where artists would get together and yes. share ideas yes. and critique each other's work. Yes, yes. And uh, it kind of, when you said support group, that yeah. sounded like yeah. Yeah. what they were doing. And, oh, yes. And it sounds like you had the benefit of uh, interacting with uh, William Pajot. Oh, uh, I mean, him, there's a number of people, but he's 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 in He's top of that, you know, and uh, on, on so many levels, like from his family life, uh, from his uh, his art practice uh, and his relationships, I mean, with, with other artists historically. So it's just so many levels and he was just like an open book, creative, and, and he was unedited. He was real. And, and he was <laughs> no, it, was, sure. it, it was no shame <laughs> in his game. And you appreciate that yeah. because, in it, you know, it, it lets you know what's possible and stuff. So... Uh, but yeah, it was it was so great to have him and a number of others in the life, and and without that, my my artistic practice would be definitely be different. You yeah. Know? So, yeah. Are there any other artists that you would cite before we? Uh, well, like I was like, when when I think about uh, artistic influences, they range from uh, again we mentioned, mentioned uh, uh, Charles White. Uh, also, there's Romare Bearden, who was a big big impact. In, in the mixed media mode I was in, and also uh, John Otterbridge, Noah Purifoy, uh, big influences and stuff like that. Uh, and there's a lot of, but those are the ones at the forefront. Yeah. 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 Fantastic. Yeah. So do you have any uh, shows that you're going to be participating in, rather, in uh, uh, the coming there, uh, months? or? There's a couple of things that's, that's c coming up. One, uh, one, one is a particular project I'm, I'm, I want to do I'm going to be doing is actually do a documentary on the black artists in LA from 1965 to 75. So I've been working on that off and on for years mm. uh, with a multiple friends, one with Sam Pace and the late Willie Middlebrook. And, but we're going to continue on the project. And so I'm going to be going doing a residency in Kentucky. Uh, and I, and I, I want to do this, put pieces together, this documentary. And fortunately this, this residency is also where Alonzo Davis is. Oh no, kidding! Yeah, so I'll be able to. He doesn't know the project yet, but but he, he will because it's going to be him and a lot of the people. We did interviews and stuff like that, uh, collected uh, artifacts and stuff from a multitude of people who were active during that period of time. And it is really a renaissance. It's really amazing. some parts of the history has been told through academia, but we haven't heard the voices of the people participating. So I wanted, so we, it's going to be... Well, it's timely, too, to catch them while they're still yes, around exactly. so you can record those voices. So we have some of them, and there's more we want to get, so I want to do that and have that completed in the end of the year. And also, too, there's also a thing where um, prob uh, there's a... Uh, in, in Senegal, in uh, Dakar, uh, it's not official, but it's supposedly, I guess it is, it's official but not official. We're going to be uh, invited to be part of the uh, Dark Art uh, uh, Senegal uh, Biennale. You know? Oh, really? Yeah, so. Uh, Will this be the first time they're doing that? Or? No, it's, it's been going on for, for some years. Oh. Uh, I did a residency back in 2004, and it was going on then. It was really early, early stages during that point in time. But it's going, it's, it's uh, going on for a while. Um, so. Um, Pretty excited about that opportunity. Oh, that sounds wonderful. Yes. And so when is that again? Uh, it's going to be. It opens in May, uh, the late, late, late May, uh, and it goes on for several months. And so you'll be in Senegal during that. Day. Yeah, I, I don't have all the details yet, but I got the email saying, "Well, you're in." It's like, but well, I haven't got my letter yet, so I don't know if I can say it, but I'm going to say it now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to speak it to existence. <laughs> That's right. We will it. We will it. Uh, yeah. Make since it since, it's, since uh, all the, all the heads are saying, like, you know, get get your tickets and get your stuff uh, and uh, the combination and stuff, so that's yeah, what's going to be happening. Set so. it all up. Yep. Excellent, yeah. excellent. Yeah. And how about public art anymore? New public oh yes, art I, uh, I'm actually working on a project for the city of LA uh, as we speak. Uh, Van Ness Recreation Center doing uh, two pieces: a, mur a, a ceramic tile mural and a painted mural because they're building a new pool uh, that's been closed for decades, and so it's going to be a, a pool house that's being built, and so we're creating the public art pieces for that. As we speak, and then also I'm be doing some work with the Community Coalition, which is a nonprofit organization that's been socially active with the uh, with all the priorities of things that we need to do in in South LA. And so I'm gonna be doing a mural on their site on their celebrating their 20th anniversary. Oh, excellent, mm -hmm. excellent. Mm -hmm. 
Well, Michael, man, I mean, this has been wonderful. I mean, it's so funny because you've shared stuff that even though I interviewed you back in 2008, yeah, I've learned like about on. for the first time, man. I mean, yeah. not just the new stuff, obviously, but yeah. even some of the some of the things yeah. from your history. So yeah. I really appreciate you oh, man. sharing with us all this uh, wonderful information. It's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. It's yeah. been a lot of fun. And also, you're, you're part of the part of the legacy of my history and stuff without you it would be, it'd be a different path oh man I really appreciate that yeah, thank you yeah, yeah, thank you yeah, yeah. thanks very much well thank you okay <laughs> hey, 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 always invite me anytime you know, I'm, you know how I am <laughs> <laughs> that's excellent man yeah. excellent much appreciated thank you thanks thank a lot you. well I'd like to uh, first of all thank uh, Michael Massenberg for sharing his perspective and I want to thank uh, all of you for tuning into our podcast and I look forward to uh, the next opportunity thank you so much Thank mm-hmm. you.